Hey y'all, you're listening to Mindcast with Calm and Jorge, the mental health talk show with connection in mind on CJSR 88.5. Hi everyone, you're listening to Mindcast. This is your host, Calm. I'm here with Mandy Lamoth, who is an activist at Young Adult Cancer Canada, and she has some very interesting and special... um, She's a very interesting and special story to share with us today about her uh, journey throughout um, her life. And Hi, Mandy. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm really well, thanks. Great. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. Yeah, no worries. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about your story? Yeah. Um, so when I was 31, um, I got diagnosed with papillary thyroid cancer. Um, So I went and had my right side of my thyroid removed, um, as well as some of my cancer ducts. Um, And that was in March of 2014. And then in September of 2014, my cancer had actually spread to the left side of my thyroid. So I went in for another surgery and had the remainder of my thyroid removed. Um, December of that year, I had um, radioactive iodine. So for thyroid cancer, you actually drink the radiation um, and then you're put in isolation for a week or two. Um, So this time around, I was in isolation for a week. Um, I couldn't have contact with anybody, my pets, my parents, my husband. Um, It was over Christmas break, too, so we didn't really do anything for Christmas that year. And then um, everything was really good. 2015 was um, a pretty good year. My husband and I ended up getting married. And then in 2016, they actually noticed on a routine body scan that my cancer was back, and it actually spread to... 12 lymph nodes on the right side of my neck. So I had to go back in for a third surgery. Um, That got followed up with um, the highest dose of radioactive iodine that they'll give a person with thyroid cancer. So my risks now are um, of getting a secondary cancer because I've gotten so much radiation in my body. Um, And immediately after that treatment, um, I started having really bad side effects. Like my lips were blistering, they were cracking, um, my throat was swelling up, I couldn't swallow. And unfortunately, I was in isolation, so there wasn't anything I can do except call health links and suck on ice cubes because I couldn't go to emergency. Um, I couldn't get physically treated unless I like couldn't breathe. It was pretty much the only reason. Yeah, and then, um, so that happened. My last round of radioactive iodine was April of 2017. Um, After that, they do like a full body scan on you to see how the cancer treatment is working because it kind of attracts itself to any of the thyroid cancer. Um, And my lights like lit up, or sorry, my lungs lit up. um, And they noticed that my cancer had actually spread to both of my lungs. So I um, have one growth in my right side, that's uh, 0.5 millimeters, and then two in my left lung, which are both um, under 7 millimeters too. So they can't really biopsy it or do surgery or treatment because the risks of puncturing my lungs is so high. Um, So I'm now on kind of a watch and wait. So I get blood work done every six to eight weeks. um, And then I get scans done every three to six months. I just had my follow-up appointment at the Cross Cancer on September 7th, and they actually cleared me. So now I'm on Um, one-year follow-ups versus every three to six months. So it's really great. It's been a very long process, a very scary process. That brings me into my next question, I guess. How was your mental health affected when you got the diagnosis? Yeah, um, I actually um, have lived with anxiety my whole life. But when I first got diagnosed, um, I got told I had the good cancer. Um, and my mom actually just finished chemo and her type of cancer was extremely rare. She had about a 10% chance of living. Um, the doctors actually told us in one point that she wasn't going to make it. Um, so I watched my mom, um, pretty much fight for her life and then um, barely pull through and then they tell me I had the good cancer. So at first I totally believed all the doctors. I was like, wow, I have the good cancer. Like just seeing what my mom went through, um, I know that I'll be okay. I know that I'll be safe. Um, I know that I'll, I'll make it 
through this. And then I wasn't getting better and I was getting sicker and I put on a ton of weight. Um, I was extremely fatigued. I could barely walk upstairs. Um, Some days my husband had to help me out of bed because my joints hurt so much and I couldn't figure out why because everyone kept telling me I should be fine. I should, I have the good cancer, like I should be better. Oh, you're young, you'll you'll bounce back. Like just work out more, eat better. Um, and I was a vegetarian at the time. So I was like, it's like, I am eating really well. I am getting a lot of sleep. Um, so I got really depressed and my family physician at the time had me on almost 28 different types of pills. It was like, I was on pain kills. I was on antidepressants. I was on pills to help me sleep. I was on stuff to help my joints. I was, I had really bad GI problems because of all the anxiety. So I was on all these like, um, like GERD medications, like just, it was crazy the amount of drugs that I was on. When my cancer uh, spread to my lungs, it was actually the first time in my life I contemplated suicide. I hit like, I got really depressed because I just didn't understand how all these medical professionals kept telling me that I had such a good cancer and my survival rate was really great. And um, it maybe will just be one pill a day, but I was on 28 pills and I could barely function. I could barely work. I put on almost a hundred pounds. Like I just felt like crap and um, no one was really listening to me. Um, I found a really good support system online but it was mostly all people in North, like in the US. I didn't really find anybody in Canada my age going through cancer. Um, and then, yeah, even the support groups that I got put into Edmonton here um, at the Cross Cancer, which is such an amazing hospital, but everybody in the group was 65 or older. They kept telling me that I shouldn't be there. Um, and everything was geared towards elderly or like, very little kids. There was nothing for my age group. So again, I felt extremely isolated and alone. And I kept a lot of my feelings inside and I was very depressed. I didn't want to live anymore. Um, And then I started Googling young adults with cancer when they um, told me my cancer had spread to my lungs. And my first Google search brought me to Young Adult Cancer Canada. So I um, immediately clicked on their survivor profiles and the first one that popped up with a girl named Amber and she uh, was in her like early 30s and had thyroid cancer and I don't even think I made it past the first sentence and I was bawling my eyes out because she was in BC she had thyroid cancer she was my age and like reading her profile I was like that is me like this is amazing that how has no one ever told me about this organization So I contacted Leslie through Yak and within 12 hours, she got back to me. She put me in this Facebook secret group that's all survivors from across Canada. Um, I had people from all over Canada welcoming me home, sending me all these like friend requests, sending me text messages, asking for like my Instagram, my Snapchat name, and like just sending me all these positive reinforcements that I was going to be okay. Um, And it was like the first time in my three and a half year journey that I felt like I was getting heard and I was getting understand um, and that I was going to be okay. So, Wow, that's really powerful. Yeah. You found um, a group of people to connect with based on your common experience. This Mm -hmm. is very, very important. So can you tell me a little bit about, um, a little bit more about what Yak does? Yeah, um, so um, Yak is for ages um, 15 to 39, um, if you're diagnosed with cancer during that time frame. Um, and then what we, they do, they offer a ton of different programs. So there's an amazing online support group. Um, it's almost a thousand people now from across Canada, literally from coast to coast. And there's even people in like Northwest Territories um, that have been contacting Yak lately too. So it's really great to see, especially in Northern Canada where it's very remote and there's not a lot of sources that Yak is getting its name up there. 
Um, we do retreats twice a year. So the retreats are either in BC or Ontario, and it's usually a group of about 30 people. Um, they're very intimate, small groups. They do a lot of talking about mental health, life pre-cancer, post-cancer, um, and supporters are welcome at all of our events too. So my husband's actually come to the retreat with me, um, and it was really great because he touched on stuff about like our like sexual like life after cancer because like I didn't feel good about my body after cancer and um, with my type of cancer um, with my hormone therapy I'm actually in premenopause already so being like 30 I just turned 36 yesterday but yeah like (laughs) thanks yeah I was like how old am I um yeah it was like starting menopause at 33 was a very weird um feeling and not really knowing who to talk to about it because I didn't understand what was going on with my body um and then they also have survivor conference which next year will be in Winnipeg and um that's a four-day event um and it's literally survivors from across Canada um and there's workshops on again like um pre-cancer life like grieving your pre-cancer life how to cope with losing family and friends when you get sick because it happened to me like I lost a lot of very close friends and it's something I'll never really understand how they could leave me when I was really sick but I'm also faced with my like mortality and I think people um, knowing that I'm sick it makes them question like their life choices and um, like oh my gosh this could happen to me Um, And then there's also like meditation classes, yoga. Um, We do fun little like spa nights at at Survivor Conference. We had like a bowling and games night. So it really tries to get people into really wonderful workshops for both supporters and survivors, but also fun activities that so you're not just talking about cancer all the time because it can be very emotional. They have mental health supporters there. They have social workers. They have counselors. Um, I sit on the social committee. So um, I'll also, like, if you need to talk, you can come find me. I'll come sit down and talk with you. Um, I usually have signs that say, like, free hugs because I love to hug people. So I'll go around and, like, hug everybody. Um, And I always do, like, a heart-to-heart hug. And um, I do, like, a one-minute heart-to-heart hug. So I took a workshop on that. And then it was just so fabulous. So now I just love heart hugging what's uh what's a heart to heart hug oh it's so great so you open up your like left hand up and then you each touch each other's heart and you want to try to do it for a minute so that you guys can just feel your heart like pumping towards each other and it's just if you do it heart to heart versus the other way you can just feel such a more connection with someone wow that's really cool I feel like for people who don't have cancer, our mortality isn't as, like, salient in our brains. And would you say that it helps to get to that mindset as well? Or does it never – What like, what do you think? Oh, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Like, with my husband, mm-hmm. um, he – came to retreat with me and he didn't really like he knew what I was going through but he didn't and I remember when we were flying back from Abbotsford he was just saying how like that was one of the best weekends of his life and yes it was geared toward cancer and grieving and um, like there was actually a workshop on palliative care and what happens if we go to palliative care but it was also very beautiful knowing if like you end up in palliative care you're taking care of your family's taking care of like they have a really wonderful team to help you get past that um and like my husband got such amazing support and he was able to open up and talk about his fear of like what happens if my wife does pass away before 40 like um or um like with me like actually physically opening up and saying the words like I might not make it to 40 that was something that I always kept in um and this is probably like the first time I haven't started crying after I said that because I just know that like, you know, none of us were all on borrowed time. I mean, I could walk, I could leave the station and get hit by a bus. Like, I just really don't know. So while I'm here, um, just make the best out of my life and make sure that even though I have cancer, I'm not defined by having my cancer anymore. I'm spreading the word of Young Adult Cancer Canada. I'm making sure that every young adult in Canada is getting connected with the organization so they don't have to go through what I went through of being extremely isolated, very depressed, contemplating suicide, um, getting in your car and bawling and not being able to drive because you just didn't want to be here anymore. Like, I don't ever want any young adult to ever feel that way. 
Uh, what would be like a something that you would tell anybody with some kind of um, illness that is that could be terminal, something like that? What would be an, a piece of advice or something that you can leave with them? Um, just that there is support out there. Um, it's unfortunate that um, like medical professionals don't always give you that the tools to find that support and hopefully with me going out there and all of us starting to really bring that awareness that will change um but just we live in such a great time that you can google a lot of things um and alberta health services has a wonderful mental health program if you call certain numbers and they can like the royal alex has that new mental health program um and just don't give up because i'm so happy that i didn't actually give up even though I felt like I wanted to. Um, I'm also very lucky, you know, I didn't like give myself alcohol poisoning with how much I was drinking. Like just there's other ways out there to to deal with your terminal illness. Um, And there's some really great programs out there that can help you get past the part that yes, you're sick and you might not make it a couple more months, but while you're here, make the most out of your time and try to leave a really good impact and impression on life and leave like a legacy. So, Yeah, wow. How do you keep mentally healthy? Um, I actually meditate every day. Um, that's something that Yak taught me at our retreat in BC um, last November. We started every morning with like a mindfulness Uh, meditation and then after every group because we did dive into some really deep emotional intense like some of the talks um, we would come back and we would meditate and we would ground ourselves again and so I left like telling myself you're doing this every day like this this is the first time you haven't had a panic attack in years when you're talking about your cancer and it had a lot to do with meditation. So I actually um, went to lifestyle meditation. I got my meditation teacher training. So I do t- I do about a half an hour of meditation every morning before. It's the first thing I do when I wake up. I go down to my basement, I sit at my altar and I meditate. Um, I also have my Reiki practitioner, um, my level one and two. So I do like a self Reiki session on What me. is Reiki? Um, it's energy healing. So it's like uh, channeled through your hands and I just scan through my whole body for about a half an hour and just uh, focus on certain points for three to five minutes. And then once I feel like that part of me has been healed, I'll move on to like my crown or my neck or my heart. So kind of like a body scan almost? In Absolutely. Meditation? Nice. Yeah. Yeah. So I kind of mix those two together. Um, and then I found journaling too to be extremely helpful. Like I um, find when I'm having a bad day or I get in that mindset again where I feel like I'm getting defeated, if I journal it, it really helps me. Um, even if I go back and visit it a couple of days later, like, do I actually still feel that way? If I still feel that way, then maybe I need to go see my um, my psychiatrist. Um, I also, I'm a really big advocate of um, medication too. So I actually am on Prozac and I'm completely okay with saying that because Prozac has helped me so much um, with all the other tools that Yak has helped me with. Just get to the wonderful mindset that I am now that things will be okay and I can't control everything, um, which was something really hard for me when I, ha- like having anxiety, you want control and you can't have control. And then when you find out your body's failing you, that's something that you just can't control at all. So mm-hmm. yeah, there's a couple of other things I do. Well, there's a lot to take away from your story, even though um, like our listeners, most of them probably don't have cancer, mm-hmm. but there's there's a lot of merit to what you're saying with like meditation and keeping healthy and and making your life worthwhile while you're here. Yeah. Um, so how does connection, so connection to the self, public, romantic, platonic, all that kind of stuff, how does connection tie in with what we talked about today? I think it's so important, especially for your mental health, to be connected, like, to yourself, to love your body. Um, I love Louise Hayes. Hey, sorry. And she does these, like, affirmation videos that you can YouTube. And it's just, like, you do mirror work. So you stand in front of the mirror and you tell yourself that you're beautiful. And you tell yourself that you have beautiful skin. And I always try to, whenever I pass a mirror, to, like, look at myself and say something that I like about myself. Um, Because I still, like... 
I'm not the size that I was pre-cancer and I'm okay with that now. Um, I've embraced the body that I have because this is also the best I've ever felt in the five years since getting sick. Um, and then just connections with my partner, like my, my husband and I are very open about like, if I don't feel good, I'm very vocal about it now. Um, and he's so understanding. Whereas before I would just push myself and then I would get sick or I wouldn't feel good. And my body would shut down. Um, and even just like relationships with my friends, like it's so important to, to your group of friends when they're that close to you, they'll love you unconditionally no matter what. So let them know, like, guys, I'm having a really bad day. Like, my anxiety is through the roof. Can we not go out for dinner and you guys just come over and have a movie date? Because I just, I can't deal with being around people right now. Um, and it's, um, even with my parents, my parents and I have always been really close, but just opening up with them and telling them, exactly what's going on versus trying to always be smiles and positive when I just don't feel like that. I also found too, like relationships with my psychiatrist has been amazing. Like I love my psychiatrist. He is, a, he's so supportive. He's so open to just helping me, which is something that like, I never really felt like I was supported to. Um, I also sought after and found a different family doctor um, once I wasn't getting better and I was getting just kept getting put on all these medications um, and I found like a female doctor that actually really spoke to me um, and then it turned out that she actually had thyroid cancer too so like we really connect really well um, and just yeah building those relationships like speaking up to yourself like your health is so important um reaching out to online support to your friends to support groups healthcare workers um if you have like a spouse or a partner your parents if you have a close relationship with them it's just it's so important to build that group of like your support network around you and just be very open about your mental health um when I first got put on Prozac, I was really ashamed. And then I was just like, why am I ashamed? Like, it's actually making me not have these horrible thoughts of depression. Um, it's not making me feel like I'm worthless. It's making me feel like my old self pre-cancer again. And I want that Mandy back. I don't want to be this Mandy that's really sad and doesn't want to do anything and just feels worthless. So, Wow, well, yeah. yeah. Has your... Um... Has your connection to connection changed since before you were diagnosed to now? Absolutely. I really treasure my connections with people much more. Um, I let go of a lot of toxic people when I got sick. I realized that there was people that still just wanted me to like go out and drink with them and party with them and I would, and um, or. I would just not like be having a good mental day and they would still be like, oh, just come out. You'll feel much better. And then I would go out and I would have a panic attack in the bathroom um, because someone would comment on my weight or someone would ask how I was doing because I looked good. And I was just like, but I feel like crap. Um, so now it's just like I really protect the circle that I'm in. I protect the friendships that I'm in. Um, I have like really close connections with a lot of my friends and the ones that I didn't have connections with or just don't understand the mental health issue um that comes with having anxiety with ha with having cancer and like the pdst of reoccurrence and all this stuff that comes with well now i'm like faced with a sickness um and yeah i just make sure that all my friends know how i'm actually doing and i don't try to sugarcoat it or pretend that everything's roses anymore if i'm having a bad day i really make sure i let people know so i feel like a lot of people in society um, they sugarcoat things like they don't actually say how they're feeling and so many people keep so many things in especially when it comes to mental health um, with cancer or without cancer like mental health it needs to be up there up front more we need to talk about it more um, we need to just make it okay that you're not okay like it's okay that you have anxiety it's okay that you're on medication it's okay that you have depression like talking about it really makes it out there more it makes it acceptable um yeah and I just think that people shouldn't be keeping that stuff in if you have some type of mental illness talk about it like it, you're only helping more people by talking and sharing your story which I think is something that's really great and like in five years it'd be awesome if every single person that had a mental illness 
openly talked about it because I think we could really help so many people in our society by being so open about it. Mm-hmm. I think you have a very interesting perspective on, um, cause like I know some people when they have mental illness, they feel like, oh, I don't feel okay and I won't feel okay. And I've already told this friend that I don't feel okay yesterday. So how do I, should I just tell them I don't feel okay today or should I just pretend I am? What would you say to somebody who isn't okay right now and is thinking of either putting on a brave face and like sugarcoating it or being honest with the connections they have? How would you, what would you say to them? Um, I just feel like it would be so much better. Like I, being in that space that I used to be in where I did sugarcoat a lot of things and, and I was just so unhappy with my life and I was so sad um, that I just don't ever want anybody to get in that mindset that I was. Um, and if you tell a friend, a spouse that you're not feeling well again that day, you can't get out of bed and they're not okay with that. Like to me, I would want to look more at that connection and be like, well, you're like, you're my friend, you're my spouse, you're my partner. You should understand that I'm going through something and I can't just put on a brave face. I don't feel well. Whether that means that maybe you two need to start going to a therapist together to kind of realize how this, how your support system can support you or um, you get put on different types of medication or just ways that you can actually really help yourself get better and you need to tell your support system that it's okay that I feel this way. Um, I'm not going to put a brave face on today, but I still like, please keep inviting me out. Please keep asking to come over because I really do love having you in my life. It's just this week is not good. I'm having a really down week. Mm -hmm. Um, I know there's that the spoon theory that's out there. So it's like you have 12 spoons. Like today my shower is going to take five spoons from me. Okay, that only leaves me seven spoons. What's important in my life? So um, I kind of, I refer a lot to that spoon theory because I'm like, some days my shower only gives me like one spoon and some days it takes six away from me. So how am I going to juggle the rest of my day? Um, I also found too, I devote one day on the weekend to just me. Um, whether it's like a, cause I work a Monday to Friday job. So does that mean my Friday evenings are just Mandy time? Um, does that mean Saturday mornings are Mandy time? Does that mean something like that is just me? Um, yeah. And I found that that's also really helps my mental health too, is devoting, even if it's just like two hours to me, just going, having a nature walk by myself or doing my meditation and my Reiki or having like a, in-depth conversation with my husband or like before I came to do this interview I had coffee with a really great friend and we just talked and it was so therapeutic because she knows I've opened up to to her a lot in the last couple of years um just about my mental health and how I'm doing um and we have such a beautiful friendship now she was one of the people that when I first started getting sick and I was angry at the world I was not a good friend um and now since I've opened up back to her we have such a beautiful friendship and I treasure her so much um and just yeah being open with her and she understands completely if I'm having a down day and I need to rebook and reschedule our plans Mm -hmm. yeah that's really um beautiful that you have found meaningful connection and I think everybody should find meaningful connection um Yeah, it's a very hopeful message that you're spreading. And I think that's very important, not not just to people who have cancer, but Mm -hmm. also to everybody who is on this earth, because we all have to face our mortality at some point and we all have to um, be okay with ourselves in that moment. So um, thank you so much for coming on the show. I really, really appreciate you being so honest and so open with uh, your experiences and with your thoughts about this. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you so much. That was so lovely. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, this is your host, Com, signing off. Um, Mandy Lamoth was with me today. Thank you so much for listening. Bye-bye. <laughs>